we're reading the Navigator's Bible reading plan together. And today in our reading, among other things, we read 2 Chronicles 13, verse 1 to chapter 16, verse 14. It's a big section, uh, but it has one line that really stands out and it's worth underlining and memorizing. Uh, it's a line from the mouth of Hanani, the seer and the father of the prophet Jehu. Hanani, speaking to King Asa in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, gives us this promise. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. It's a key text for life, one of 16 essential Bible verses to have memorized to meet life's hardest battles, according to you, Pastor John. That's a list you gave us back in APJ 1798 and summarized in the Ask Pastor John book on pages 44 to 46. So the point is, God is eager to work for his people. That's the main point of that line. As we meditate on this text today, after we read it together, uh, explain three things for us. Number one, God's eyes in this verse. How are they roving and roaming? Uh, What theology do you draw from this? Number two, God's support. What comfort do you take from the strong support, quote unquote, being promised here? And explain the qualification of of who is blameless toward God or whole toward God, as the ESV footnote puts it. The King James Version translates this as a heart that is perfect toward him. Uh, The NIV says that it's a heart fully committed to him. The Holman Version says this is a heart that is completely his. A listener to the podcast, Sarah, in the Philippines has heard you teach on this text in the past, uh, drawing a distinction between blameless and sinless is not being the same thing, but she needs you to explain this difference more fully. What would you say? Well, I love this verse. I really love it because it has a special place in my affections because it came into my life. My awareness of it came into my life while I was discovering back in 1968, 69, the preciousness and the the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. The reason it had this effect on me in those days was that it put the sovereignty of God in the service of his eagerness, like you said, the eagerness of God to help me if I simply trust him. Mm. Not to help me if I work for him, but if I trust him, he's going to work for me. He's going to be strong On my behalf, if I look away from myself and look to my Heavenly Father, his broad shoulders, his huge biceps, (laughs) his strong back, and and those bright eyes just full of eagerness to show himself powerful on behalf of those who simply trust in him. So that that was just an amazing picture for me. I don't know how I had how I had missed it for 22 years or so. But it certainly made the embrace of the sovereignty of God a more precious thing. So the verse says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. They roam about throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. I'll explain that translation in a minute. On behalf of those whose heart is whole toward him. So let's take your three questions. Number one, what about those eyes of the Lord roaming in the earth. The phrase, in the eyes of the Lord, in Hebrew, occurs 92 times in the Old Testament. It's really quite amazing. Hmm. And there are other phrases with the eyes of the Lord that don't include the word in, in the eyes of the Lord. And it has several meanings. It can refer to God's omniscience, like in Proverbs 15.3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Or it can refer to his awareness and assessment of things, like Second Chronicles 34, verse 2, Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Or it can refer to God's special approving and helping gaze, like uh, Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are toward their cry. Now, in 2 Chronicles 16.9, it's referring to God's intense attentiveness 
and eagerness to act in a certain way toward a certain kind of person. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is whole toward him. And it's a striking contrast to what many people feel, because many people think of God as, if he's got eyes and they're running through the world, they're scrutinizing the world on the lookout for something to punish. Yeah. That's the way a lot of people feel, like the eyes of the Lord are snooping. They're not looking <laughs> for ways to help. They're looking for ways to punish. That's the kind of image of religion that H.L. Mencken had when he said mm-hmm. that famous thing. Remember, Puritanism is the, <laughs> the haunting fear that someone somewhere <laughs> may be happy. <laughs> That's, <right. laughs> That's rubbish. Yeah. That's rubbish both totally. for Puritanism and it's rubbish for the Bible. Mm. And this verse says... God's eyes are roaming around, not looking for someone to make unhappy, but the opposite. Namely, what? What? Now, that leads to your second question. So, what, what is he wanting to do? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is whole toward him. So, this peculiar form of the Hebrew word is reflexive, show himself strong. A reflexive verb in Hebrew, the hit pile here, means the action reflects back on the actor. It's not wrong to translate it, give strong support. Hmm. But the peculiar reflexive idea of God showing himself to be the kind of person who loves to give strong support would be missing if if you only said it that way, I think. And that's part of what makes this verse so precious and powerful. God's eyes are roaming around, stalking, so to speak, to put a different twist on it, stalking, like like in uh, Psalm 23, the goodness and mercy shall follow me, Hmm. stalk me, pursue me all the days of my life. And they're, they're doing it in order to be on behalf of someone. He wants to show himself strong on behalf of someone, not against someone. So when I came to see 55 years ago that this inclination of God to show himself strong was for me and not against me, what I saw was that it was flowing out of his total self-sufficiency where he has no need of my services at all. Instead, he wants to serve my good. Mm. And, and Acts 17.25 became part of that season of discovery. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. So did Isaiah 64.4 in those days. No eye has ever seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Same thing in Psalm 147.11. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs, strong legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who hope in his steadfast love. That whole cluster of texts came alive for me as I was discovering the sovereignty of God and how his total and complete lack of need for me made him eager to serve me Hmm. when I depend on him. It was just a glorious discovery, which leads now to the to the last question you ask about uh, who who gets to qualify for this. Like Mm -hmm. who is blameless or who is whole? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of whom? Those Is my translation, those whose heart is whole toward him. I think translating it, those whose hearts are blameless, is hard for English readers to grasp because almost everybody thinks of the term blameless as perfection. Mm -hmm. Um, And if that were the case, he wouldn't help anybody. (laughs) There aren't (laughs) any perfect people except one. The phrase whole heart was used, for example, just to show its limits, to contrast Solomon with David. 1 Kings 11.4, 
when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not whole or wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Oh my goodness, David was anything but perfect. But on the whole, no, no pun intended, on the whole, he repented as he should and stayed true to the Lord. And so he could be contrasted with Saul, who turned away from the Lord, and David, who stayed with the Lord and was said to have a whole heart for God. I think there's a good picture of it in James, the book of James, chapter 1, when it talks about uh, doubting and praying for wisdom. It says that when we pray for wisdom, we should not be double-minded. What does that mean? I take it to mean part of us says, God is good, God is reliable, God will help me, and part of us is saying, no, God is not good. He probably is not going to do any, any good at all when I pray. And the whole heart says, I trust God to be wholly good to me. He's going to give me all the strong help I need to do his will. My heart's not split in half. I'm whole toward God. Half of me not saying God is un unreliable and half saying he is reliable. I think that's what a whole heart is. And that's the point here in Second Chronicles 9. Asa, this is talking, I mean, he, this is the king who, mm -hmm. who has been good and doesn't end so well in his life. He was helped in his victory over the Ethiopians and the Libyans, it says, because you relied upon the Lord. Your heart was right towards God. You looked away from yourself and you depended on me. I gave you the victory. I showed myself strong on your behalf. So, conclusion, let's ask God to shape our whole mindset, our whole disposition toward God. He is on the prowl to show himself powerful for us, not against us, when we trust in him. Hmm. Yes. If I trust him, he's going to work for me. He's going to be strong on my behalf. If I look away from myself and look to my Heavenly Father— his broad shoulders, his huge biceps, his strong back, and those bright eyes just full of eagerness to show himself powerful on behalf of those who simply trust in him. A glorious discovery indeed. Thank you, Pastor John. And no surprise, this is one of 16 essential Bible verses to have memorized to meet life's hardest battles. That's a list that includes 2 Chronicles 16.9, our focus today. Find that whole list in APJ 1798 uh, in the archive and summarized in the APJ book if you have that book on pages 44 to 46. Thanks for joining us today. If you have a question to ask Pastor John, email me, askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. And if you're looking for APJ 1798, you'll find it at AskPastorJohn.com. Well, we all need friends. So what makes for a best friend? We'll look at that next time. I'm Tony Ranke. See you on Monday.